you. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar on basket trials. Uh, my name is Sam Shao, and I'm Associate Director in the Strategic Consulting Group uh, here at CITEL. Uh, today, I'm delighted to have Dr. Robert Beckman join us here at CITEL in Cambridge, Massachusetts, to share his thoughts on basket trials. Our goal is to help you better understand the methodological issues as well as potential implementation challenges, particularly in the confirmatory setting. Following the presentation, we'll have some time to address a selection of your questions, and you can submit questions using the WebEx Q&A panel, um, but please uh, withhold them until you see our prompt uh, toward the end of the presentation. Uh, we'll get to as many as time allows. Um, today's slides uh, can now be downloaded at citel.com slash events. Uh, where you'll also find a link to FDA's recent, uh, released, uh, recently released master protocol guidance document. Everyone listening today will also be sent the link to the audio recording when it becomes available later this week. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert Beckman. Uh, Bob is a leader in uh, clinical oncology research with uh, emphasizing quantitative approaches. Uh, he has a versatile publication record uh, and a record of leadership showing a history of successful collaborations and initiatives across multiple areas, including personalized medicine, biomarker-driven clinical development, tumor evolution, and adaptive designs. Uh, and I myself actually first happened upon Bob's work when he was, when um, I was helping a Cytel client um, in an early phase uh, basket trial design. Uh, Bob is currently Professor of Oncology and Biostatistics, Bioinformatics, and Biomathematics at the Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center uh, and the Innovation Center for uh, Biomedical Informatics at Georgetown University Medical Center. Uh, he also is a consultant for industry trial sponsors. Uh, welcome, Bob. It's great to have you here today. Thank you very much for that uh, very nice introduction, Sam. Um, and um, uh, uh, so I'm Bob Beckman, and I'm going to talk about the design concept for a confirmatory basket trial. Um, and as you can see from the nature of my appointment, I'm an oncologist who's had a lifelong interest in, in mathematics. I'm not actually a, um, a full-time statistician. Uh, and when I do work like this, I like to collaborate with um, uh, real statisticians. And much of this work uh, was done uh, uh, together with um, Kang Chen, from Merck, um, and Cog actually led the, uh, the group that developed this trial, co-led the concept development, and also led all the statistical and simulation work for the initial design. So what I'm going to present today is more than half his. There were also major contributions from Zorad Antonijevic, who is no longer at Amgen. I'm sorry, that's out of date. He is now at Z Adaptive Designs, his own consulting firm and Raska Kala Megan from Genentech. Uh, you see um, a number of other people uh, who were in a pathway design subgroup who contributed to this. And the pathway design subgroup is one of five working subgroups of the DIA uh, small populations work stream where DIA is Drug Information Association. This is a group of 50 statisticians and clinicians from industry, academia, and national health authorities, including the FDA and EMA, who are uh, working on uh, small populations and rare diseases. And this group in turn is part of the DIA Adaptive Design Scientific Working Group, which has greater than 200 statisticians and clinicians from industry, academia, and national health authorities, including the FDA and the EMA, and is working on uh, using innovative adaptive designs, um, developing them so that they can uh, bring medicines to patients. Um, and uh, if you're interested in joining the Adaptive Design Scientific Working Group, I'd uh, love to have you. My emails are shown there. Um, I, I lead that group. And there's another group that focuses specifically on Bayesian methods led by Fani Natanagara from Lilly, and that's her email. Um, so uh, outside of oncology, I'm going to be talking about mostly about oncology today, but we should understand outside of oncology that there are up to 7,000 different rare diseases and an estimated 30 million sufferers in the U.S. alone, and about half uh, of these sufferers are children, and many of these diseases are progressive, debilitating, and lethal, and without innovative trial designs, we really don't have a good way to uh, develop drugs for these um, uh, 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 populations with such a large unmet medical need. Um, within cancer, which used to be a common disease, we now have the increasing discovery of molecular subtypes, 
leading to small subgroups that, 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 that are like orphan or niche indications, even within large tumor types. And enrolling enough patients for confirmatory trials in these indications may be challenging. So the shift to molecular view of cancer requires a shift in drug development approaches and the exclusive use of one indication at a time will not be sustainable. So there's several approaches to development based on predictive biomarkers. Um, one is to optimize co-development of a single drug and its companion diagnostic. And this gives a clear answer and a clear hypothesis. And I think it still has a role in orienting us but it will be challenging to do in niche indications and we can't do it all the time. Uh, umbrella trials involve a single tumor type with multiple drugs and predictive biomarkers. Um, and patients are matched to the drugs based on their predictive biomarkers. There's cooperation among multiple sponsors. And um, I give some uh, famous examples on the slide, battle, I spy, and lung map. So uh, basket trials, have multiple tumor types with one drug and, a, and predictive biomarker. And the evaluation is often based on a pooled analysis. In some designs, this pooling can be partial based on a Bayesian hierarchical model, um, and the degree of pooling can be adjusted based on the data. In other designs, indications are actually considered individually, and the basket is then more of an operational tactic. Um, the premise is always that the molecular subtype is more fundamental than the histology. And basket trials, unlike umbrella trials, could be done by a single sponsor. But importantly, uh, and, and, and we have this in red, uh, there's an opportunity for multiple indications for the sample size of one, which is a dramatic potential uh, patient and resource savings. So I'm going to further introduce basket trials. Then I'm going to give a general design concept of the confirmatory basket trial that um, Kong Chen and I have worked on. Um, challenges um, of basket trials in general and, and recommendations for overcoming them. Some performance simulations of the design and, and, and uh, conclusions. So the original basket trial in oncology was a, was a landmark study uh, with 40 different rare malignancies encompassing 186 patients, very small sample size per malignancy. And, and these patients all had um, uh, 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 overexpression um, uh, or activation of the target kinase, uh, kinases of the drug imatinib or Gleevec, which was one of the uh, uh, first and most famous um, rationally designed uh, drug to a molecular target in cancer. And this drug had already been spectacular. All of these um, uh, subtypes of cancer had, had no uh, uh, standard of care, and, and they were uh, they were very uh, devastating diseases. Um, and um, so, as a result, uh, it was possible to do this study uh, without much regard to statistical rigor. Very small sample sizes, no control groups. Uh, uh, each uh, each tumor is on its own. Uh, and out of these 40 different malignancies, the four in the uh, lower right uh, are were approved. And aggressive systemic mastocytosis was uh, proved because um, there was a response or a tumor shrinkage in one tumor out of five. Um, and um, so this is uh, really uh, was uh, uh, groundbreaking and well justified, um, but only um, uh, 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 only because uh, Gleevec was such a special drug. So um, then we had another special drug, uh, pembrolizumab, uh, uh, which is, uh, or Keytruda, which is um, used to activate the immune system against cancer. And it was approved in MSI high solid tumors, uh, which is a DNA repair defect that leads to an increased mutational burden, which in turn creates uh, neoantigens, which uh, the immune system can react to. And tumors with an enhanced mutational burden uh, seem to do better. Um, um, do we were having a problem with the mic? Do we want to, um, should I keep going or keep going? I think it's on our, our, our problem. Okay. Um, so, uh, so anyway, um, uh, there's an enhanced uh, mutational uh, burden in some of these tumors that leads to enhanced immunogenicity. And there's a lot of science suggesting that on average tumors with, uh, 
high mutational burden will be more likely to benefit from um, these kinds of therapies. And um, spectacular results are seen among responders that have never been seen before. Um, and so um, five single arm studies were pooled uh, and the primary endpoint was overall response rate. Again, overall response rate is not guaranteed to really correlate with survival, um, uh, but they had an overall response rate of 40% and 80% had a duration of greater than six months. And even though most patients in the study had colorectal cancer and there were 10 other solid tumor types that were represented by very small sample sizes, approval was for any solid tumor that had this biomarker, and MSII. Um, again, because uh, pembrolizumab is a very special drug. Uh, so the features of these designs, uh, and, and I should say a similar design was uh, endorsed uh, uh, for vemurafenib, another very special drug, at a Brookings Friends conference in 2011. These uh, trials are exploratory and opportunistic in nature, uh, uh, but, they, but they can be used for confirmation under exceptional circumstances. Uh, and you can have, in those circumstances, single-arm trials with uh, overall response rate as a primary endpoint. Um, and um, uh, you can sometimes use a pooled population where the individual tumor type is not adequately powered. But these designs involve possibly transformative medicines in patients with great unmet medical need and seemingly exceptional, exceptionally strong scientific rationale. And I've emphasized possibly and seemingly because of what I, I call the gifted child syndrome, uh, which is to say uh, uh, I'm a parent and I have two children. Um, and um, and I, um, I assume that my uh, children are extremely gifted and uh, I will not um, listen to any arguments to the contrary. So I, I'm biased. And you know perhaps if you spent years forming a biotech company around a single drug, you might be biased. Uh, or if you spent 10 years in the lab creating it, or, um, or um, if you're, you're running a pharmaceutical company with a large portfolio, but this just happens to be your favorite drug. Uh, and, and, and so you have to be very careful about this bias. We don't want these examples to lead to um, uh, 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 people's bias getting the better of them, and they're all trying to do, they all think they have Gleevec or, or Pembrolizumab. Um, so, um, and there are many issues with trying to do this if you don't have Gleevec or Pembrolizumab. Uh, first of all, even if you do, Vemurafenib was an exceptional drug, works like a charm in melanoma, uh, but it doesn't work in colorectal cancer that has the same mutation. Um, and uh, that was not anticipated. Not all drugs are hoped to be that are hoped to be transformational live up to this promise. Response rate may not predict overall survival. Single arm trials are subject to many issues, but the one that is most stubborn to any statistical correction is patient selection bias. Uh, predictive effect of a biomarker is, is confounded with its prognostic value if you don't have a control group. Um, and also uh, health authorities can be non-committal up front. So when I worked in the pharmaceutical industry, um, uh, many uh, biotech companies came uh, wanting uh, us to in license their products. Um, uh, and they all said that the FDA was very enthusiastic about their development plan. But in fact, uh, in most cases, when I looked into it, the FDA simply said to them, well, you know, show us the data and we'll tell you what we think, which is uh, just a polite non-committal response um, showing the bias. Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, so the DIA small population pathway subteam asked, can we develop a generalizable confirmatory basket design concept with statistical rigor applicable not only to exceptional cases, but to all effective medicines? Because the, these uh, special drugs get all the hype and they get all the uh, exposure in high profile journals, uh, but most of the medical benefit that's delivered by, uh, 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 by our enterprise is really based on many, many, many unsung drugs that work well, but are not exceptional. Um, uh, and we wanted to follow existing accelerated and standard approval pathways to increase potential provability. And this would allow us to increase access to medicines for patients in niche indications, provide sponsors with cost-effective options for development of niche indications, provide health authorities with more robust packages for evaluation of benefit and risk. And now I have in red caps, 
most of drug development resources are spent in the confirmatory phase. So everybody's presenting basket trials that are good for ex the exploratory phase, and they're going to, they're going to be able to reduce the the, uh, the the 10 to 20 percent of the cost that's in the early phase. But the other 80 percent uh, is um, it would be good to reduce that. Um, and just to emphasize this point, because it's the one thing I want you to remember from the talk, um, I'm going to say again, most of drug development resources are spent in the confirmatory phase. So uh, Willie Sutton was a masterful bank robber. He robbed banks in the 1930s, 1940s. Uh, he was caught in the 1950s. He escaped from prison and continued to rob banks for another 20 years. Uh, and it's widely re uh, regarded that he made Jesse James and uh, John Dillinger look like amateurs. So this guy really knew what he was he was doing. I don't know if Saitel is going to have him as a web on a webinar, but he but but he really knew it, his field. And um, uh, he was asked at one point um, uh, he was asked at one point whether uh, or why he robbed banks. And he said, "I robbed banks because that's where the money is." So again, the money is in the confirmatory phase. That's what I want you to remember. So um, I'm going to present a. Um, general design concept for uh, confirmatory trials. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, beautiful diagram is courtesy of Roscoe Palamegum. Uh, and and each, um, each shape represents a potential um, uh, indication. Um, and the first thing you need to do is select the indications very carefully um, because um, uh, a basket trial, it's like having a basket of fruit. And if you have one moldy fruit in there, it may spoil the entire basket because it may dilute the uh, the effect uh, from the indications where the drug is effective. So you really have to select these carefully um, and uh, based on the scientific and medical data. Now, partway through the trial, you may have access to other data. You may have found some real world data, or there may be other studies coming out in related drugs. And so you can uh, you can prune, uh, which is in the next line. Um, down, uh, you can prune uh, based on external data, um, and you uh, eliminate the uh, orange shape. Um, and then you have an interim analysis, which is based on uh, an interim endpoint in this particular example. Uh, and based on the interim analysis, uh, these shapes are not doing well, and so you're left with only two shapes. Those shapes, if you powered, uh, if you powered for a sensitive interim endpoint. Uh, and, and, and they uh, have statistical significance, uh, could potentially get accelerated approval. Um, then they go all the way to the definitive endpoint at the bottom of the funnel, uh, and there's a pool analysis of the definitive endpoint that should lead to full approval. Uh, but uh, uh, again, um, uh, in, the, in the subsequent iterations of the design, we're going to check each of these indications uh, at, uh, at perhaps a somewhat non-stringent type one error rate, but we're going to check uh, 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 these individually as, as subgroups. And of course, the FDA will too, and they could always uh, remove one. So uh, this is in Word. Some of what I shared has some additional details. Uh, there's each, each tumor histology should have its own control group, but it can be shared if it's common across them. A randomized control is preferred, but we do have uh, variations of this that, that can be done with single arm cohorts. Uh, and response rate kind of uh, endpoints. Um, and an example of a particular interest that, that, that I sort of presented in, in, in this slide, we have a surrogate endpoint such as PFS and interim, and it's more sensitive, and we power each indication based on that surrogate endpoint. Um, uh, but in an alternative approach, we can look at interim at partial information on a definitive endpoint. Um, initial indications, again, are carefully selected. Uh, they're pruned, as I said. Um, uh, when you when you prune or remove an indication, you will have to do a sample size increase to the remaining indications to maintain the power. We'll get to that. Um, and there's also an issue with um, uh, with uh, 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 type one error. So doing this or, or false positive rate inflates the the false positive rate, and you have to work to a lower nominal false positive rate so that the, after inflation, it's within the FDA guidelines. And this will be discussed in more detail later today. Um, study is positive if the pooled analysis of the remaining indications is positive for the definitive endpoint. Um, and uh, we uh, use full, pool, full pooling 
rather than uh, partial information borrowing because we felt in the confirmatory phase that the indication statement that the FDA wants to approve or the EMA wants to approve um, uh, is going to be um, uh, hard to define if you have partial um, uh, partial borrowing between indications. Uh, and again, some of the remaining indications may not be approved if they don't show a consistent trend for positive risk benefit. So now I'm going to go into the challenges of basket designs. Oh, um, yep. And uh, Bob, I just would uh, interrupt you here and, and say um, that was a really nice overview of the, the design concept. Um, before you get into the challenges, I wonder if you could just highlight um, what the differences might be between the confirmatory and the exploratory setting. Are there particular elements of the design concept you would want to modify to make it more suitable uh, for one setting or another? So, so the exploratory setting is more flexible. Um, so in the exploratory setting, you don't have to use a definitive endpoint at all. Uh, you also um, uh, can, uh, if you need to, you don't need to, if you need to omit the control group, have a non-randomized design, you could do that, uh, at least if you have a response rate uh, endpoint. Um, and also, I, I think, um, and we didn't explore this for the confirmatory design, but I think in a uh, exploratory design, uh, we you could certainly apply Bayesian hierarchical models and, you know, partial information borrowing. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, so then the challenges of basket designs and the recommendations for overcoming them. Uh, challenge number one is having a control group. In some settings, a control group is not ethical. And uh, really the standard is um, uh, would you want to be enrolled yourself or have someone you love uh, enrolled in the control, control group? In other words, is there enough clinical equipoise, which is to say you, you don't really know which arm is better. Uh, and uh, for this to be true, you really need the experimental agent to not be uh, uh, one of these very special drugs that uh, has been uh, doing so uh, spectacularly well. And also you need to have a credible standard of care for the control group. Uh, so for example, we're simulating a basket trial with steroids plus or minus rituximab for refractory autoimmune diseases, where steroids are known to work and rituximab is an effective but not transformational drug. Um, uh, so, um, uh, and the uh, current generation of non-randomized basket studies in areas of oncology where there's no standard of care, these transformational agents are going to become the standard of care for those indications. And then other people are going to have to go against them doing an add-on design where there now is a credible standard of care and then they're, they're going to uh, be able to use a control group and be able to use a design like this. Um, uh, so the risks of pooling are substantial. Uh, one or more bad indications, as I pointed out, can lead to a failed st fail study for all indications in the basket. Uh, and histology can affect, uh, uh, and it does this by diluting the, um, uh, uh, diluting the effect from the uh, active indications. Histology can affect the validity of a molecular predictive hypothesis, and this can't always be predicted in advance. So then, again, vemurafenib is a classic example, which was effective for BRAF V600E mutants in melanoma, uh, but not for analogous uh, colorectal cancer tumors. And this was not predicted in advance by, uh, um, uh, by science. It was only when this was observed clinically that the scientists went back to uh, explain this in retrospect. Um, and, and there's a feedback loop which allows the colorectal cancer cells to just go around bemurafenib, not present in melanoma. Um, so it, it, first of all, um, we recommend for this challenge that it would be good to have already had a lead indication that was approved by conventional methods, which has validated the drug, the predictive biomarker hypothesis, and the companion diagnostic. Now for, for bemurafenib, they had that melanoma, uh, but yet they still would have gotten into trouble. So this is not risk-free. Um, the indication should be carefully selected. Um, and the indications, as I outlined, should be pruned in several steps before pooling. Uh, now I'm going to take you through a series of challenges that um, uh, when I was um, uh, in a uh, uh, panel discussion with uh, an FDA member uh, that, that she brought up um, uh, 
some issues that she would like to um, uh, see a sponsor consider uh, and evaluate herself if she got this to review. Um, so one thing she said is that different indications may have different endpoints. Now, I actually think this is less of an issue for oncology. We, we have uh, uh, response rate, progression-free survival, and overall survival, all of which are known under different circumstances to be acceptable endpoints. Um, and we're, uh, uh, my group is currently simulating an autoimmune disease basket trial where um, every arm of the trial uh, has uh, autoimmune phenomenon in a different organ system. So some people have neurologic symptoms, some have low blood counts, some have kidney trouble, uh, but we created generalized interim endpoints across these diverse diseases by having the interim endpoint be an improvement or response and the final endpoint being the time to worsening. Um, and, and I think this can be done. Um, the FDA person also pointed out that the time scales of endpoint development may differ. Uh, I believe the answer to that is what matters is relative, relative improvement. And if necessary, you can normalize the time to event data to the medians on the control arms so that you're just looking at relative improvement compared to a normalized control. Um, and the study completes when the data is mature on all arms. So as a tactical matter, uh, I don't think you want to put, you know, um, five uh, fast indications and one really slow one in the same basket, because you're going to have to wait until all six are done. Um, um, challenge number five is that the standard of care may differ between arms. And again, what I would argue is what matters is the relative improvement in a redefined disease entity that is based on a molecular biomarker. And actually the FDA person uh, talked about the importance of having the science to redefine the disease entity when the science is more important than the statistics. The science is really key that why are you putting these things in a basket? Uh, safety must be assessed uh, both as an individual analysis relative to the individual controls, which may differ, and as a pooled analysis relative to the pool control. And safety data to support this should be available from uh, other indications and from phase two studies. So uh, challenge number six uh, posed by the S FDA, the threshold for approval may differ between arms. Uh, uh, and uh, again, I would argue that the thresholds for relative improvement in, in the classic oncology endpoints are well established. And so if you look at the relative improvement against the normalized control, uh, um, I, I think you're going to be able to assign a very sensible threshold. Uh, so, Bob, I wonder if you could just elaborate a bit on challenge uh, six. Um, the, so, so if, if the pooled analysis is what ultimately is, uh, determines whether a study is, is positive, um, uh, I recall in challenge two, you mentioned a, a bad arm could spoil the pot, but what if the bad arm isn't bad enough um, or, or uh, or the very strong arms carry uh, the weight in the final analysis. Uh, what would you do? It seems like the bad arm would be coming along, uh, you know, for a free ride. Uh, what? How? How should that be dealt with? So, the, so, so, so that is a problem for um, uh, control of of the uh, false positive rate. Uh, what we have in the design is one check in interim. And we found, which I'm going to get to, we added uh, to the design based on simulation, a, um, a formal post check where you where you check each subgroup, uh, not necessarily at a uh, false positive rate of 0.025 or an alpha 0.025, but at a higher alpha. And with with these two checks, you can begin to um, you can begin to control um, the uh, type one error uh, by the tumor type. And I, I will say one more thing, though, which is that um, we do trials like this all the time, and we're used to doing them, but we don't call them basket trials. So, 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 so we we say we're going to enroll in first line lung cancer, and there are all kinds of subgroups in first line lung cancer. There are all kinds of molecular subgroups. There's men and women. There's older and younger. You know, different races, and the FDA doesn't ask us to guarantee with statistical significance in every subgroup that, that we don't have a false positive. They do an informal analysis. But, and the only problem is here that, uh, that people have to get their brains around the idea that this is 
now it's inverted that what used to be the subgroup is now the whole group mm -hmm. and and what used to be the whole group is now the subgroup yeah. but it's the same concept and and so i'm not sure the fda is going to require um uh, a, 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 a false positive uh, control for the subgroups if you come to them with a, a compelling scientific rationale for redesign, redefining the disease. Um, so um, anyway, so moving on, um, uh, challenge number seven uh, is the clinical validity of the predictive biomarker hypothesis, which you can't really verify without having biomarker negative patients. Now, in a case where you don't have a good standard of care, the, uh, the study may be very unattractive for biomarker negative patients. Um, but, uh, and, and even when you do, people are there really for the experimental agent. Uh, and, 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 and the experimental agent should be something that you think works on them. So the biomarker negative patients, there's a challenge. Uh, we would suggest um, um, having a small uh, stratified cohort for biomarker negative patients where if you have four indications, each indication uh, contributes a quarter. So you're basically looking at, um, you know, let's say, a fifth indication in that example. Uh, that's the biomarker negatives. Um, and only evaluating them on the surrogate endpoint. Um, uh, and if, it, if, if, if the surrogate endpoint shows possible benefit, then you're going to have to expand to more biomarker negative patients. And, and so this is just our idea. We don't know uh, what health authorities would think about that. Uh, uh, we think it would help if you already had an approved lead indication to provide some clinical evidence for the hypothesis and some uh, supportive uh, prior phase two studies. So uh, adjusting for pruning is challenge number eight. Uh, pruning indications that are doing poorly on surrogate endpoints may be seen as cherry picking. Now, what, what this means is if you have uh, a bunch of indications under um, uh, the global null hypothesis, which, which means that, um, that the drug actually does not work in any of the indications, um, and you evaluate them in interim, due to the play of chance, some of them may have fluctuated so they look positive just due to random chance. Um, and then those are the ones that you're going to carry forward in this design if, if you have a drug that doesn't work. And, and you're going to reuse that data. So all of those arms have started with a little bit of a head start. They had a, a positive fluctuation. And this is um, cherry picking, and it will inflate the false positive rate. So uh, in terms of addressing the challenge, if you use external data to uh, prove you don't have this issue at all, and if you're using interim uh, data uh, uh, from within the study, uh, I will I'll get to methods for calculating the penalty in this talk. You have to apply these rules prospectively, and the statistical penalty you have to take is not large enough to offset the advantages of the design. So, uh, so here we uh, begin to talk about this. We have K tumor indications, each with a sample size of N, randomized one to one. At a time T, we do an interim analysis, and the cutoff for moving forward is a P value of alpha T. Um, and we're going to have to conduct the pooled analysis not at alpha equals 0 0.025, but at a lower alpha usually, alpha star, so that the overall type 1 error is controlled at alpha after you adjust for this um, uh, cherry picking inflation, which we call random high bias. So in order to um, uh, compute alpha star, uh, we uh, show some mathematics in, in this slide, uh, why I wanted to test statistics um, uh, up to the interim analysis and why I too are uh, overall to test, test statistics at the end. And what the expression in the second bullet uh, 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 says that in, in a case where if you have K indications and M of them passed uh, the um, uh, beginning interim check, um, uh, then, um, uh, then you, you have an expression for the chance that uh, M will pass the interim check, the others won't. And then the pooled value of, uh, of all the M indications will be positive at the end. So you express that uh, in the second bullet, and then you sum it over all possible values of M in and in a weighted sum uh, by their uh, 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 probability of occurrence. Um, and that all has to equal the alpha that you're really shooting for. Um, so um, the, uh, we just talked about um, uh, uh, controlling under the global null hypothesis where, where the drug doesn't work for any of the indications. But Sam already asked me the question of, 
you know, what is, what do you do if some of the indications are inactive and others are active? And of course, you won't know this. That's called strong control of the family wise error rate or FWER. The problem is still open. Uh, the challenge, as, as Sam rightly said, is that you could have strongly positive indications. If an, if an inactive indication gets past the interim check and is now uh, pooled with a wildly positive indication, then the average is going to look positive and, and, and this uh, uh, indication will, will get falsely approved. Um, and so at, at this, uh, you can only approach this problem by simulation. And even in simulation, you have to uh, choose how you're going to do it because there's an infinite number of cases. You could choose any value of activity for the active indications. Um, there was a recent study out of Royal Sloan Kettering, which simulated a popular Bayesian uh, basket trial design and found that the family wise error rate was as high as 57%. And actually, that sounds bad, but it's but it may not be bad, and I'm going to explain. But but the but the but the authors of the paper they don't uh, comment on the number. They just say that each basket design should um, simulate and determine its uh, uh, family-wise error rate and report that. Uh, so there's transparency. Um, now, why might it not be bad? Well, I, I already mentioned this in the, in the conventional design on the left. Uh, you don't call it a basket trial. You call it a old-fashioned phase three study, and you have all these subgroups in there, and you don't know if they're important, gender, age, you know, DNA sequence, et cetera, et cetera. And you just do a primary analysis on the pooled population, and if somebody wants to know, you know, does it really work in women as well as men, they do an informal, non-powered subgroup analysis, and nobody's asking them to specify that, to keep that under control. And this basket design, is really just the same thing, except it may be better because you're trying, you're actively trying to prune the inactive ones and then taking a penalty for that. Um, so, um, and 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 the, um, you know the comment may well apply to the basket design, which was um, uh, you know, discussed in the Royal Sloan Kettering paper as well. Um, furthermore, if you have a basket trial with K indications, um, you would have, if basket trials didn't exist, do K independent trials. And collectively, the chance that at least one of those would have a false positive is approximately k times 0 0.025. So, uh, so I would argue that we should be shooting for k times 0 0.025 for the family-wise error rate if we care about a family-wise error rate at all, where k is the number of indications. Um, and we may even consider for the statisticians looking at false discovery rate rather than uh, 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 FWER. Um, so now the availability of tissue is also a challenge. Uh, tissue sampling and processing are variables that can greatly affect the outcome of a study. And in basket studies, you're gonna to have to have cooperation between the breast cancer department and the lung cancer department and the colorectal cancer department, none of whom have ever talked to each other before. Um, and, and if you don't get exactly the same sample processing and sample quality from all those different departments, you're gonna have a misleading study so we actually recommend hiring a pathologist to train the investigators and, and their pathology departments and to uh, troubleshoot during the trial. And the pathologist has their full-time job to just do that. They, they're engaged for the study. Um, um, uh, there's going to be a high screen failure rate if your um, biomarker has a low incidence. And most of the patients will have gone through the um, the time and energy to try to get into the trial and they'll be rejected. And so, uh, and, and they don't have time to waste, obviously they have cancer. So um, we recommend uh, providing broad-based testing like next generation sequencing, which will give them some guidance on what they will be eligible for. Um, finally, interim endpoints may not predict definitive endpoints. Uh, but we, uh, we recommend pre-filtering the endpoint uh, uh, based on external data, uh, and, and pre-filtering the indications based on external data, or even maturing definitive endpoint data from phase two in your own development program so that you can have some of the definitive endpoint uh, incorporated into your uh, adaptation. Um, um, and um, uh, we uh, require a consistent trend in the definitive endpoint for uh, final full approval. Um, 
Um, and and so uh, uh, this is a, uh, 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 an example of using the phase two study. Uh, in the upper figure, we have the traditional thing where the phase two study uses a interim endpoint to give you a go, no go decision, and then is largely ignored. And then in the phase three study on, on the right, uh, you have uh, an adaptation, which again has to be based on an interim endpoint because there isn't much data on the final endpoint. But you could continue to pay attention to that phase two study and use the definitive endpoint from that maturing study uh, uh, to adapt. Uh, and, and, and that might be better if you design the program so the phase two and phase three studies are very comparable. Um, so another possible source of external data is real world data. Uh, the uh, simulation that I described for you uh, about autoimmune diseases uh, is uh, uh, being done by a team led by a postdoctoral fellow, Daphne Kin, um, and she is getting real world data on off label use of rituximab in autoimmune diseases from the Georgetown MedStar Health System uh, to see if that can improve the performance of the trial. So coming to performance, uh, there are um, uh, uh, I'm now going to give an example of a situation um, where you use the same endpoint throughout, um, uh, and um, we're going to assume that there's six tumor indications with a hazard ratio of 0.6, uh, meaning you say take uh, survival from six months to 10 months on the experimental arm. Pruning occurs when half of the events have occurred, and we assume that the number of target in, of active indications out of the six, which we call G, ranges from three to six. Uh, and what I want you to focus on is the, um, uh, on the very left-hand column, there's uh, uh, 200 and 300 patient examples. In the next column, there's a number of active tumors. And then go right to the bolded column, which is the power for a positive study. Uh, if you use the sample size readjustment strategy, which we recommend, which is the most aggressive one, which is to say you add the patients back so that the pooled analysis has the original plan sample size, even though you may have pruned several arms. Um, in another application of special interest, you could have PFS as the interim and OS as the final. Um, and here we assume uh, 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 hazard ratio of 0.5 in PFS. Uh, we have six indications, each requiring 88 events or 110 patients. Uh, and then we uh, apply the sample size readjustment at the end. We're looking for 430 death events. Uh, and we have 90% power to detect a hazard ratio of 0.7 in OS. And uh, we are operating uh, under a, um, uh, a, a uh, alpha, a, a, a nominal alpha of 0.8% rather than 2.5%, but it gets inflated up to 2.5%. And we have the potential to gain six approvals based on a comparable sample size to a conventional phase three trial. Now, the question is, what if, despite everything I said, uh, the health authorities insist on um, uh, controlling the family-wise error rate? And, and what would that do to your power if you had to control that? Um, and so we're looking into that uh, 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 with the help of Yuru Ren, a graduate student, um, Valerie Karastyshevsky, uh, uh, a faculty member at Georgetown, and Sammy uh, Wang, who's a, a colleague of mine and of Kong Jens at Merck. Um, and um, uh, we're currently simulating what we assumed uh, a hazard ratio of one for inactive indications and 0.7 for active. There's an infinite number of cases we could look at. We're not going to look at an infinite number of cases because we don't have infinite funding. Um, but um, uh, but we. Um, uh, uh, we want to simulate different scenarios in the basket uh, where the number of, of indications that, uh, uh, that, are, uh, that are known to be active in the true state of nature uh, varies um, uh, 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 over all the possibilities. And we're going to pick the worst possibility uh, and say that's the type 1 error rate. And that's what we want to control. And we want to control that at K, the number of indications, times 0.025. Um, now, what we found when we did that is uh, just like the um, uh, heralded, heralded design that was um, uh, um, uh, discussed in the Royal Sloan Kettering paper, uh, that we have a embarrassingly high uh, 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 FWER uh, error rate as well, and we have to add an additional post-correction step. After the pool, then we check each indication further. Um, 
uh, and I should say that a long time ago, I, I did um, uh, 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 some uh, 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 theoretical work in DNA replication, how it manages to be so active. And one of the things that we found was that um, in order to avoid, uh, is, is, so a DNA enzyme uh, puts in a next uh, uh, base that it thinks is right, and then it checks and removes spaces that are wrong. And we found that it checks at least twice, and that um, two checks at moderate levels of fidelity is better than one really, really accurate check. Because if you have one really, really accurate check, you end up cutting out a lot of the um, uh, correct ones, and, 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 and it's like losing power in the study. Um, so I'm hoping that two very different areas of science will actually converge here. So um, anyway, our preliminary results, but well, we have six implications. Uh, we power the pool at a very high level, 95%, because we know all these checks are going to reduce the power. Um, we have, uh, 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 we do the interim analysis uh, halfway through. Uh, this is all with the same endpoint. And we use these values of alpha at the interim and at the post check, which we found to be optimal. And we can retain 50% power, but not 80 or 90% power. So you're not really getting six indications for the price of one. You're getting maybe three on average. And if you have a basket with three indications, you can get 70% power. So it's like having two on average. So um, uh, we want to do further parameter optimization. We want to apply heterogeneity detection methods. Uh, Rich Simon has a very interesting uh, approach published. Uh, we want to study the application in the case with a surrogate interim endpoint, which we haven't done yet. And we're still working on applying RWD to the study design. So uh, challenge number 14. Now, I, I had no challenge number 13 because I want everyone to have good luck with all the challenges. Um, but challenge number 14 is what I call the standoff. So health authorities that, that understandably won't commit until given a real example to consider. And sponsors are understandably cautious about being the first to innovate in the confirmatory space. So one resolution for this is that the FDA under Purdue for six, uh, which is their uh, congressional mandate, uh, uh, is doing a pilot program for these so-called complex innovative designs where a new company can have an, an, uh, an, an extended uh, conversation on a design like this with the FDA and, and extended guidance, and they will look very closely at it. Um, and um, and if they approve it, then um, then uh, you know that is that's good, of course. And this is a risk I think we must take for our patients. And I just want to say, people think this may be a stressful process, but uh, I was able to leak this confidential photo of a uh, of a sponsor uh, and the FDA having a discussion about a complex innovative design. And as you can see, it's it's uh, quite a collegial process. Um, so in conclusion, um, it is feasible to create a general design concept for a basket study that is suitable for many agents. Multiple challenges can be addressed with careful planning. And benefits include increased and earlier patient access to targeted therapies for small subgroups uh, and cost-effective methods for sponsors to develop targeted agents in small subgroups. And, uh, and also, hopefully, there'll be more robust data sets for health authorities to assess benefit risk. Um, these are the um, uh, 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 key references. Uh, the second one is um, uh, for a general audience describing this design uh, with me as the first author. The fourth one with Kong Chen as the first author is the uh, 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 primary statistical paper uh, supporting it. Um, and then um, uh, somehow it got left off there, but I uh, wanted to say that there is a uh, new book coming out uh, from uh, 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 Chapman and Hall, CRC Press, which I'm going to um, uh, shamelessly plug. It is, um, um, uh, uh, discusses umbrella trials and basket trials um, and is edited by uh, Zoran Antonijevich, uh, who is a key contributor to this, um, and myself. So uh, with that, I think it's time for questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, and as we, that was a very interesting, informative presentation. And as we wait for um, questions to come in from the audience, I w wonder if you could speak um, a little bit more to the regulatory perspective that, that was mentioned a few times, uh, you know, interactions with FDA, the PDUFA, and so on. Um, and as you know, uh, this September, FDA 
uh, released a draft guidance on master protocols, and there was some mention of basket trials. And I, I wonder if you could speak a bit about what you think um, that, that guidance reveals about FDA's current thinking on basket studies and what um, how that might compare, for example, with the European Medicines Agency perspective, um, and what suggestions might you have um, going forward for future versions of, of any uh, regulatory guidance documents on basket studies? Okay, so um, so the um, guidance document um, did a wonderful job of reviewing what the FDA has already set as a precedent, which is all um, really for um, special drugs that were kind of having an exception to the usual statistical rigor, an appropriate exception. Um, uh, and uh, 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 and they ad uh, addressed the exploratory uh, uh, type of trial, but they didn't really address um, uh, uh, confirmatory space in a general manner. And that was actually the Adaptive Design Scientific Working Group um, submitted comments to them. We had many comments, but with respect to this talk, our comment was actually, um, we would like you to um, um, give us a little bit more information about what you're thinking with respect to the confirmatory phase. Uh, I can tell you from having been on, on a panel that um, uh, basically they, they want uh, a sponsor to appear with a specific proposal and then they're gonna think about these things. Mm -hmm. um, um, and um, I also was um, uh, presented uh, to the EMA in a, um, in a uh, closed workshop. Uh, and uh, my sense is that uh, in general, it's a little more conservative in Europe. Uh, if they accept the basket trial for uh, confirmation, I, I think it, that they are, they were uh, uh, kind of saying that they liked the rigor of this design. They didn't weren't saying they liked it enough that they would, you know, you, they, I don't know whether they liked it enough, but they, but 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 they were more interested in having a basket design with some level of rigor. Um, and um, some of them appeared to be um, unhappy with the um, United States decision to approve Pembro uh, in that uh, basket study of MSI high. This is just my interpretation, obviously, so it uh, um, could well be wrong. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks very much, Bob. Uh, we, we do have a question. Um, okay. The audience is wondering if they're particular, um, what, what are the safety monitoring challenges, um, particular to basket trials? Do you have any comments on that? Um, well, I think, uh, and so, so uh, for one thing, the, uh, the causality uh, may uh, the, the assumed causality of a of a safety event may differ between arms because for the SOC in breast cancer this side effect may be so common that it's most likely due to the SOC whereas the, if the SOC in colorectal cancer is different um, so this is one of the reasons why we say that um, uh, we feel that the incremental contribution relative to the control arm, and it's another reason to have a control arm, in each subgroup uh, is important, uh, as, as, as well as the pool, but each subgroup individually. And, and we ideally, we presume that you've done some phase two work and, and some phase one work, and you haven't um, just you know, skipped over those phases, um, uh, and so you have some additional safety data. But, but, but it, it, it is important, I think, to look at each arm individually and then um, uh, try to piece the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. This this particular talk didn't uh, really focus on um, other types of platform trials, for example, umbrella trials. I know people are hearing all of these terms nowadays uh, quite a lot. Um, do, you, do you have any particular comments on these, these other types of, of platform trials um, in, in general? So the first comment is that um, I and a number of my colleagues call these platform trials, and and the book that I'm plugging is titled Platform Trials. Uh, but the FDA, uh, based on a New England Journal of Medicine article that they I would I would talk in Lavange, and based on their recent guidance, would like to call them master protocols. So um, uh, so and and under master protocols would be umbrella trials, basket trials, 
and platform trials would be the uh, perpetual trials that can keep on en enrolling uh, new drugs into them. Um, so I, I think the biggest problem with an umbrella trial, I think, is that you, unless you have all the drugs for all those biomarker subgroups, then you need to um, collaborate with other um, sponsors. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit more of a sociological problem. You could join one of the well-known platform trials that are being organized by academic groups, uh, such as iSpy, LungMap, and so on. Um, uh, and I, I, I think that's certainly one difficulty with umbrella trials. Um, you could have a patient who's positive for more than one biomarker, and then you have um, uh, several different approaches to assigning that patient with various complex consequences. Um, uh, and you also, um, uh, I think you need in an, an the umbrella trial an arm for the people who don't match to anything, you know, so that they are not left out. The, there was uh, one one question, uh, sort of expressing interest in elaborating on again the, the phases of, of development at, at which a basket trial would be pertinent. Um, this talk was really concentrated on confirmatory the confirmatory setting, but um, well, what are some thoughts you have with regard, for example, to examples of basket studies in different phases? Mm -hmm. Have we seen anything come out in a confirmatory setting yet? Sure. <laughs> so, 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 I, so I think, uh, so the questioner is saying the presentation suggests that only phase two studies really have basket trials. And, and, and I think I actually gave two examples that, uh, well, three, uh, Gleevec, Bemirafinib, and Pembrolizumab, where there was a confirmatory basket trial, but it was really designed like a phase two trial that got approval, yeah. you know, and, and, and these were four fantastic drugs. So um, this talk today was actually about trying to bring basket trials into the confirmatory space in a rigorous way that would be more generally applicable. Um, and, um, you know, there are, um, uh, several uh, uh, sessions uh, or, or several uh, several challenges of that, but I you know I would say that if somebody wants to do that, what I would advise I would advise two things. First of all, get into this Padufa six program and start talking to the FDA very early. Come up with your list of questions, some of which you could get from this talk, um, and also ask them what is their level of commitment if they approve it because. Uh, based on their adaptive design guidance, uh, they won't necessarily give you a spa if, the, if, you, if your protocol is too complicated and they can't review it in four months. Mm -hmm. So what assurances do you have that they will, um, what assurances do, do you have that, that they will, um, uh, 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 they will commit to approving your design once you've had a success, successful discussion with them? Um, and at the same time that you're discussing with them and starting early, you should have a more conventional backup uh, because we don't yet know. Um, uh, but, you know, you have, if you win, you get six indications, you know, um, for the price of one. And I think that's really um, why I hope that someone will take the risk because once they do and they have this discussion with the FDA, then I think they will, uh, uh, this will open up. That's what we're hoping. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The, the in in one of the slides you talked about uh, the simulations that you were performing and and the assumptions on the uh, the alternative hypotheses. Um, I think one of them had a hazard ratio of point point seven, while others had a a hazard ratio of one is that what kinds of range of scenarios have have you explored and do you can you give a sense of kind of how the type one error is affected by the different assumptions on the alternatives so um so we haven't explored it yet we're, we're still um uh working out bugs in the software we have a non-statistician and several students so it's not quite like the Cytel group but, um, but 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 once the software works we hope to do that what I would say is that if, if you have 
let's say a, a highly positive indication as a ratio is 0.3 or something like that, then um, if the active indications are going to be that active, then you can uh, squeeze the situation by having a much more stringent alpha at interim. Um, and, 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 and that will hopefully make up for the, uh, for the risk of having the uh, inactive ones carried along because you'll be able to eliminate more of them. Um, and, and also at the end, the same thing. Um, so my hypothesis is that, it, but we haven't looked at it yet, it, is that um, uh, there will be a way of the optimal alphas at interim and the alphas for the post check will have to be more stringent, but you'll be okay with your power because you have this super active indication that you're trying to find. How important is the time of the interim looks? Yeah. Okay, um, so um, so far we've looked at that uh, uh, just with the hazard ratio of 0.7, and we went from an interim look at 0.5, uh, you know, up close to one. And um, it seems like later looks may be marginally more effective under those conditions, but it was a small effect, and I think it probably is going to depend on the parameters. And um, I, 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 again, another thing I would say is that. Uh, if someone ch chooses to do this, um, they need to have a um, uh, resource for lots of simulations to convince the FDA. You know, the, 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 they're, they're going to have to have a rationale for not doing an infinite number of cases, which cases they chose. Uh, then they're going to take this to the FDA, and the FDA is going to say, well, why didn't you do this or that, right? And then they're going to have to go back and, and do that. So um, some of these things that I think uh, because they're dependent on the parameters, most likely um, um, you might find with parameters that are relevant to your drugs that you get a different answer than, than we've been getting. Mm -hmm. uh, is the FDA requiring uh, uh, confirmation um, uh, of the apparent assumption of exponential survival? I don't know, but in conventional trials, they don't seem to get too upset about that. It's used all the time. So I don't see why they would be more stringent in, in, in this setting. Um, there's uh, the, uh, is it detrimental, or how detrimental is it to the basket trial design to have individuals randomized with a false positive indication of the biomarker of interest? So, so that's what we kind of uh, looked at when we varied in, this, in the simulation that we have done so far with the actives of hazard ratio of 0.7 and the inactives that has a ratio of one, we varied the number of um, inactive indications uh, and we uh, uh, picked the worst one as the false positive rate, the worst case. So usually the worst case uh, was somewhere, uh, 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 somewhere in between. In other words, if you had uh, zero or one false positive indications, you didn't have many chances to err. And if they were all false positive, that then the study would easily be seen as negative. But if you were kind of half and half, that's where you um, had the maximum uh, type one error rate. Uh, and because you don't know in advance, um, uh, your, your power is reduced, you have to assume the worst case scenario. Now, the, the powers that I quoted, which was 50% if you have six indications, and 70% if you have three indications, um, uh, those were only if you had um, uh, uh, either four or more out of six or uh, two or more out of three. But you know, if the clinical and scientific people give you five out of six that are losers and only one that's a winner, mm -hmm. and you put that into a basket, you can't fix that with statistics. That's why I say the science is important. You should be confident enough that if you have six of them, you could say, um, you know, I'll eat my hat if it's less than four. You know, if, if you if you really think there's a chance that only two out of six are active, then you probably uh, don't have the right group of indications. Uh, well, I think that's all the time uh, we have today. I want to thank. Uh, Bob, again, uh, very much for sharing his thoughts, his thoughts, and uh, thank you. And uh, thank you to the audience uh, for your engagement. Um, 
Bob is going to remind you how to get in touch with him uh, by putting up his contact uh, information again on this slide. There we go. Um, and, and also, if you're interested in, in Bayesian methods, uh, you might be interested in contacting Fadi Nadanagar, who leads a very um, uh, uh, wonderful group in that area. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that reminder, Bob.